All right, kia ora, kato nga mai, hari mai. Welcome to this EHF Mini Springboard. We're excited to have you all here for this session today, which is maturing New Zealand's innovation ecosystem into an economic driver. So just checking you are all in the right room, okay? I know there's a lot of Zooms going on these days. So some quick background context before we begin. This is one session that we're running this week of different topics which are in line with EHF's organizational strategy. This session is innovation, and it's going to be led by our CEO, Rosalie, who will shortly share future context and framing. Um, you'll find in the room today, we've got EHF fellows, we've got New Zealand organizations, and also interested collaborators. You'll find there's entrepreneurs, there's investors working in future technologies, sciences, and policy. There's change makers, there's educators, there's innovators and policy workers, and even creatives already active in innovation in New Zealand. Some quick housekeeping before I formally open the session. This session will run until 5.30. It is gonna be broken into two segments uh, with a natural break at 4.30. So the first one is 90 minutes. We'll have a five minute break and then we'll be moving into actual breakouts. And the, the breakout session I'll be taking, this first session Rosalie will be taking. It is being recorded. It's been live streamed as well. Um, the main presentation that is the and the panel discussion. And it's running on Facebook, if I'm right. Is that right, Paulie? Cool. Uh, we ask you stay on mute when not speaking to limit background noise and interruptions. We will use the raise hand function under reactions. And Rosalie is going to moderate questions. Just unmute yourself uh, when you're prompted to speak or put them in the chat and I can field them from there for Rosalie, if you like. Uh, rename yourself, as I've said, it's really good for us to be able to see who's in the room. Um, fellows, cohorts, and maybe the place that you're actually coming in from as well. It's good to see what parts of the world you're from. After this session, we will also be publishing a summary, uh, next steps, and an invitation for you to actually continue what we're gonna be doing here today. So I'm just gonna open this session with a karakia Timatanga. Kia hora te marino. Kia whakapapa paunamo te moana. He huarahi mā tato e te ranga nei. Arahu atu, arahu mai, tato e e tato kato. Kia ora. So thank you for showing up today. I'm excited to see where we go. Over to you, Rosalie. Kia ora. Kia ora, enga mana, enga reo, enga ro rangatira mā ki te manu whenua, te atiawa taranaki whanui, Tēnā koto. Ko Edmund Hillary, ko tā Edmund Hillary te tangata, ko Edmund Hillary Fellowship te whare. Ko Rosalie Nelson, toku ingua, ko te Chief Executive Edmund Hillary Fellowship a hau. Māori ora. Uh, look, I just want to send out a huge thank you to you all for taking the time to join us for this springboard session. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, we are a cohort of over 500 world-class innovators, entrepreneurs, technologists, scientists, creatives, educators, and investors who have been drawn into and are committed to Aotearoa as part of a global impact visa program. Uh, our purpose is to partner with Aotearoa to find and build solutions to some of our toughest challenges so that we inspire global leadership and solutions for future generations. So today's topic, how we can unleash our startup ecosystem to become an economic engine, is really one of those very gnarly and systems challenges. Aotearoa does have a, an emerging vision for its startup ecosystem, that in the next 10 years, we can transform the New Zealand economy to be a world leader in sustainable value creation and innovation, grounded in empathy, for people and planet. Today, you could best describe our ecosystem as, as emergent. After 15 years, we do have some areas of real momentum. There is a strong and vibrant uh, community of around 1,500 startups, over 1,000 angel investors, and we've got about 12 plus active early stage venture capital companies. Startups have created estimated over 50,000 future focused jobs. There's been nearly a billion invested in over 1,500 deals. And we do have some emerging and strong growth sectors, particularly in ag tech, life sciences, med tech, gaming, fintech, and aerospace. 
However, our startup ecosystem does remain subscale and it is not yet an economic driver. Our exports as a percentage of gross domestic products remain static and we do remain overly dependent on commodities. Our productivity and investment in R&D is low, well under the OECD average, and we do face constraints in access to talent, global connections, capital and entrepreneurial skills. And equity, equality and diversity do remain a challenge, particularly for our Māori and Pacifica innovators. Right now, we are at an inflection point in history with climate change, COVID, and a world that's also awash in capital. So what we want to explore today uh, through our panelists and through our speakers is what are some of the critical levers we have that will drive substantive impact over the next two years? And what role can our fellows play in helping to drive some of that collective impact in partnership with New Zealand leaders? So today is the beginning of the conversation. Um, you, we have got some amazing speakers. I'm so grateful for the time and commitment they've made to this. And this, there will be chance for you to connect, to discuss and to share your views. I'm sure there'll be a lot of views. So just sit back, relax and enjoy the discussion. Um, we're beginning the session with scene setters. So we're initially um, joined for, I guess, the keynote discussion by J.F. Gautier, who is the founder and CEO of the Startup Genome Project. And he's going to really bring that global perspective about New Zealand's stage of innovation growth relative to other global markets and what we need to do to accelerate our potential. We then bring a very on the ground uh, perspective from four of our systems leaders. There's Suze Reynolds, who is the executive chair of the Angel Association in New Zealand, and a Kominik, who is the Asia Pacific Director of Advanced Aviation Company WISC, but also our new board chair, uh, Francis Valentine, who's the founder and chief executive of Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab. Um, Frances is very much a, a disruptive educator, um, really looking at how she can equip for future skills. And then Aubrey Tekhanawa, who was until very recently the program director of the Māori Accelerator Program, Kōkiri, at Te Wānanga o Aotearoa. Um, look, as Michelle noted, there will be time for Q&A throughout. So if you have a question, please put it into chat or put the hand up through the raised hand icon, and then we'll go into the break. So I want to begin the session by welcoming uh, JF as the founder and CEO of Startup Genome. Um, JF is a Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur who became and has become a global leading voice in innovation ecosystem development. He's advised more than 100 governments and public-private partnerships across 35 countries about how to develop their ecosystem. He's founded five businesses, he's led others across two continents and achieved two exits plus one scale up. And he is an active angel investor and does have a background working in corporate innovation advising companies like IBM, Cisco and Agilent HP. Um, so JF, welcome. And thank you so much um, for your time today. Um, I know that you're beaming in from the United States and it's probably going to be get pretty late in the evening. So thank you. Um, I just want to kick off, thank you, by asking, um, can you just tell us a little bit about Startup Genome, what it, what it does? So Startup Genome is an organization created by entrepreneurs first in 2011 with Steve Blank and couple of professors from Stanford University and Wharton to study for the first time through our own communities, through entrepreneurs like us, what are the success factors for startups? You know, when you talk about uh, the validation stage, the, deliver, the discovery stage, these are startup genome uh, phases of the startups. And then we move to ecosystems, realizing that actually most of our success depends to on the ecosystem, not on just what we do in our startups. I don't have control over that. And I always ask people like, if you, if if Zuckerberg had been had been in a small city in Africa, what would have been his chances of success? Right? Zuckerberg didn't build Facebook. So over the years, we've 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 grown this research into a startup that we sold to Sage, that became the AI you know department in Sage. But when we sold it, we decided to keep 
you know, the research and turn it towards an advisory uh, company, research and advisory companies to help policymakers do better policies for startups all over the world. And this is our way to give back and make sure that startup ecosystems grow all over the world, not just in Silicon Valley and a, and a few top places. So that's our mission. That's what we do full time is just researching and advising governments on policies and learning from you know, the best governments in the world that have a lot of experience and knowing what failed and what didn't, what succeeded so that we can all learn together and help each other uh, build those engines of growth and, start, and uh, job creation. Jay, if one question that you must be asked a great deal is every market will be quite unique. It's going to have its own characteristics and it's those characteristics that will shape the startup ecosystems. So how do you manage to compare across markets, across countries, when there is such massive differences? Well, the differences in, is in the culture, is in the strengths, right? Some cities like Frankfurt is undeniably great at FinTech and not very good at you know, other subsectors, for instance. But the way they make startups successful is very replicable all over the world, right? What is, what is a funder doing to build a startup, the lean startup methodologies? What should an angel investor and a VC investor do? Uh, you know, the global knowledge there really helps every individual in every city learn about their role and get better. Uh, so of course there's a lot of, uh, so what we do is we bring global best practices from all of these learnings that apply generally to different cities. And then in each city, we work with the local government, the local community to tailor this to the local reality, the local culture, so that we don't apply exactly the same thing, right? Because the problem's a little bit different. The organizations the, the, in the ecosystem that are important are different, have different roles, they're differently structured, et cetera. So we bring the global best practices, they bring the, the, ta the local tailoring, and together we, we, we apply you know, we, we, we start programs and, and investments and policies uh, to spur growth of the ecosystem. So thank you. So you've been looking at the New Zealand ecosystem for two to three years now. Where do you see us relative to other markets? I think I, I talked to Suze about uh, six years ago now when we just started. <laughs> and uh, New Zealand was actually one of our first uh, members of this knowledge network uh, when we spun off into this new organization. Um, and I've seen, you know, the New Zealand startup ecosystem grow a lot, right? And a lot more entrepreneurship, more support organization, more funding. We've seen at the beginning, there was much more uh, gaps and we've worked with the governments that took our assessment and enacted policies very effectively. So over the years, we've seen a great transformation and improvement of the startup ecosystem. And we talk about phases at Startup Genome, probably a lot of people here today are familiar with the activation phase and the globalization phase. And at this stage where you have about a thousand startups and more than a thousand startups, that's when we say you're, you're moving to the globalization phase, mm -hmm. right? So most of your work, most of your attention to so stop being just on the local, but actually, and you need to continue to work locally always. And you need to start allocating more resources uh, to the global. And I think it really uh, applies to the reality of New Zealand in, in, it, in where it's at as a startup ecosystem, but also as a, an economy and, and its needs in terms of being a small market that can create you know, corporations with, you know, 10,000, 10, 20,000 jobs, or even a hundred corporations that create that many jobs without, you know, starting to be better at marketing globally. And so, so this I'm is hearing... a challenge, right, is, is going global for the scale, scale ups to create that mm. engine of growth that you were talking about. Mm. So it sounds as if we've moved, we're moving towards late stage activation, early globalization, would that be a fair characterization? Yeah. So what, in your view, are the key areas of focus and levers now? And also, where are you seeing the momentum occurring? So, you know, the, the, the change has to be in terms of, you know, culture of all of the stakeholders in the startup ecosystem to start working differently from the start. 
right? In the past, if you were just building new entrepreneurs, you work on local problems, the startup accelerators, incubators, they can work locally. Once you start wanting the startups in their first, second, third year to be starting to go global, all the startup organizations need to change, right? They need to have their own network. They need to start saying, okay, I need to connect them and take them out of my country and my city and bring them to the US, bring them to Europe. How do I do that? I need to start myself thinking global as an as a ecosystem builder, as a startup accelerator. Uh, and so am I belonging to a, net, to a global network? Am I learning from peers in other ecosystems? How do they create scale-ups? Am I make, getting this network to be available to my startups so they can piggyback on my work so that not every startup has to build its own global network? Are the investors doing the same thing? Right? Are the VC investors going every quarter to, to Silicon Valley, to New York, to, say, to London, to Singapore, to meet the venture partners of global firms that have a global network that could help close a series B, not only with capital, but also bring a bench of chief operating officer, chief marketing officer that can help the entrepreneur scale the company in the US, in China, in Europe, right? So the, the VCs, and the angels have this role also. Say, so are they are they connected to investors in other countries that can also then invest in my local startup so that then they can have relationships and access to a, a global network of experts, investors, customers, right? Industry mm -hmm. experts, technical experts. So this is the, the this is the work of everyone. And of course, the entrepreneurs, right? They need to get out of their comfort zone and say, I need to go to San Francisco once in a while. I need to go to London. When we look at startup ecosystem that made that transition beautifully and very effectively and some, some surprisingly well, like Stockholm, right? That created four or five unicorns in the years 2014 to 2016, 17. And at Startup Genome, we're wondering what did they do different? Mm. And one of my partners said, I have really great design skills. You know, and, and I'm like, I doubt this is because they have great design skills. <laughs> and so far, we, we studied the entrepreneurs and they were, the entrepreneurs traveled more than anybody, more than anybody else in the world, except Tel Aviv entrepreneurs. They would mm -hmm. go to London for business, you know, a couple of times a year or, the, or San Francisco and they develop their network so that they can call on marketing experts, investors and, you know, mm -hmm. etc. in other countries and therefore, they were much more successful at getting out of their country, but even getting out of their continents when it was time to market. Jay, so uh, the question that of course immediately springs to mind is how do we do that in a COVID <laughs> environment would be the first thing. And I guess the, the follow on to that is, um, it, it's fantastic to hear that we've moved, but are we moving fast enough relative to the rest of the world as they adapt to COVID? Yeah, so the, the COVID issue has been a, a, a blessing and a curse, right? Where tech has grown a lot faster and we've broken these physical barriers. So, you know, when I talk to some of the, the best, you know, VCs in Singapore over COVID, they were saying for the first time we have companies that can market globally because the physical barriers are broken. It doesn't matter if our company is in Singapore or London anymore, which is great. What also happened is that the face-to-face -face goes, goes down and the sense of community where I want to help someone is really help when we go have a beer, when we go have dinner, when we need in person and we have trust. Uh, so that, you know, mm. has been difficult with COVID. Mm. But face-to-face -face still has, a, has an importance, I believe. Uh, but hopefully we're, we're migrating out of it. I know I started traveling again in October. I've already gone to Berlin, Singapore, Copenhagen and Miami and Montreal, and I'm going to Sweden next week. Uh, so hopefully we're getting back on the road, but that's been, that's been a, a easier to create connections and feel like we belong to the global community during COVID. It's been harder to mm. get strong uh, connections of, you know, I care about you, you care about me, you want to help me. Mm. Uh, but that thing, uh, hopefully that's changing. And uh, I think this is this is now as we're reopening the importance of like going back to let's travel, let's meet others, let's get out of our comfort zone. Jay, 
if, if you look at New Zealand internationally, we're not really famous for any particular type of innovation. Are there areas of strength or advantage that you can see are clearly emerging for us now? Yeah, and you were asking me before, and I didn't answer. What, what, where are we? Are we growing mm-hmm. fast enough? Are we improving fast enough? And you know that I try not to. You know, there's the average, right? Are you creating a lot of startups faster than, than others? I think mm-hmm. before COVID, the last data we had, you were a little slower at creating new startups, and that was a little bit concerning. But I think through mm-hmm. COVID, uh, clearly you've grown very fast. But what I care more is that you invest and focus on growing what you're good at and betting on this, right? Creating specialized programs, for instance, in ag tech you were talking about, right? Life sciences. Yeah. And I know clean tech is big on your agenda and it's a fast growing segment. Uh, so this mm-hmm. is what, this is how startup ecosystems accelerate is by focusing on your local strengths, not being, not try to be good at everything. And mm-hmm. you're not an enormous, an enormous country. You don't need to be go at five sectors to create a lot of jobs, right? So mm-hmm. focus is, and when you're a small ecosystem, focus is the name of the game. And so, you know, you know what your strengths are. You just name them just at the beginning. Right? I'm not going to repeat them, but ag tech, life sciences, and and others. Well, it's just and, looking for validation. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is you know I think you you know it because it's in the data, right? You've seen mm-hmm. exits and you've seen. Uh, creation of startups and now the question is as an ecosystem how do we bet on those strengths so that we don't just create you know funding policy but also focus funding policy how do we create funding policy for instance sidecars so mm. that accelerators that are focused in ag tech also can write a check and bring mentorship plus capital as opposed to you know separating the two right mm. so how do we bet on those strengths with a with a set of programs and policies where we accelerate. Because once you start creating scaling expertise and scaling experience and success in ag tech, it's transferable, right? You have their chief operating officer that build a big organization mm. really quickly, mm. ahead of HR, ahead of marketing, ahead of sales, mm. right? And they can come, mm. they can go to the other subsectors. So focus is very important. And so you're you're growing, but I think the big problem is you're top of the pit, right? You don't have a lot of that scaling skills not only lacking in, among entrepreneurs, but also among your executives. The entrepreneurs that are at Series A and starting to create an inflection point, it's one thing to be entrepreneur and be chief sales officer for a while, but at one point you need a chief operating officer that's done yeah. it before and a chief marketing officer. So either I have a network globally who's done it or I have people locally who've done it before or I'm in trouble. And that's yeah. what the problem is. And you know, Tech City UK, Tech Nation created the Future 50 program, the upscale program to remedy that problem with really great success where London was recognized for early exits, you know, eight mm-hmm. years ago before that. And now is the number two at creating scale up number three with New York. Uh, so we've created a program to do that and it's needed everywhere. So this is your challenge. Now, how do I create those scaling skills and this global mindset mm-hmm in the investors, in the startup support organization. But when I look at your funding policy, it's been very effective at funding more startups. But when I look at the check size, it's too small to fund global growth. So that's a change yeah. in mindset, right? Instead of funding 50 startups at 2 million each to, to invest my $100 million fund, what about I invest in only 20 startups, 5 million each, right? But, really change in mindset for the investor. And that's mm. throughout the community, that's what we're talking about. Jay, thank you. Look, I'd like to open it up to um, anyone who would like to ask questions at this point. Please just either put it into chat or put your hand up uh, because there is still so much that uh, we can explore with, with JF. And so look, while we're, um, while we're waiting on that, What's the role of, ah, no, we've got Mark Bregman. Mark, hello. Rosalie, you knew I would have a question. I did. Uh, <laughs> so it's, I agree with an awful lot of what you were saying, Jeff. I, I do wonder about that last portion, though, where there tend to be smaller checks and, and frankly, a gap in the capital available within New Zealand. I think that's caused some people in New Zealand to think we need to have a way to fund these New Zealand originated companies through their life cycle. Therefore, we need bigger capital pools and bigger checks. And I mean, I've heard commentary when a 
New Zealand company goes, for example, to the U.S. market because that's where the customers are and raises money in the U.S. market because that's where the money is. Oh, no, we've lost another company because now they're a U.S. company. And I, I contrast that with what I've heard with Israeli companies, and I'll exaggerate a little bit, but until the last Israeli member of that company dies, it's a new Israeli company. They don't care where it is. It's Israeli because it started here and it's our intellectual capital. And that global, it's back to something you were talking about. It's the global startup community that the Israelis look to. I worry that there's still a parochial view in New Zealand of that because of the fear of companies going to the US. Rocket Lab, oh my God, they went public in the US. We've lost another one. That's a success, but it's not necessarily perceived that way because the, there's still this somewhat parochial view of capital sources. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on that. It, it's a continuum and all of these solutions are good, right? It's good that the best startups go get a big check in Silicon Valley, right? And go towards a big exit. I always mention ways which move its headquarter to Palo Alto. And if they didn't, I doubt they would have exited at, what is it, 1.7 or $2.3 billion. And 10 employees were in Palo Alto, but 90 were in Israel, right? And they did very well and they became angel investors and started new startups, these people. So leakages are okay and it's a continuum. And now in the last four or five years, Israel has worked on creating the same version of Tech Nation Future 50 to help companies scale larger before they just sell. And, and the Deputy Minister of Innovation in Ontario says, we need to stop being uh, producers of Christmas trees where we build it, we grow it to 10 feet, we cut it and we ship it to the US, right? hundred million dollar company, we cut it. So, you know, what you're saying is, is exactly right. And at, the, and at the same time, right? When the local investor starts writing bigger checks because they know that success comes with going global and they know that with a $1.5 million, 2 million checks, it's not going to happen, right? So they're risk averse. They say, let's let's create smaller checks and spread it over more so that I have more chance that a few will make it at least medium big. How do we change that? And of course, some 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 VCs, it's not all the VCs that will have, that will have the capability, but do we have one or two BC, VCs that are pulling the market up, like an Omers did in, in Ontario, like a Balderton did in London? like a Jungle Ventures is doing in Singapore, where one is better capitalized as, as starting to build a big network and are willing to write a $10 million Series A. And don't, when the other ones, the other VCs are competing for good deals, they're like, you know, the, that firm is gonna write a $6 million check. I need to match, I need to go up, right? And they're pulling everybody up. Uh, so that that's what I'm talking about, right? And of the, course, the flip side of this, the flip side is is getting New Zealand on the radar for the foreign VCs uh, to come in and invest at that earlier stage, which today they're really not. I mean, I talk yeah. to lots of my friends here in Silicon Valley. I show them interesting companies and their view is I'll wait till they're big enough and they're already here, which, by the way, means they're missing out on earlier opportunity. Yeah, so I have something very specific to tell you about that. So we, we've been working with the sole metropolitan government to internationalize their local VCs. Um, and that give us the opportunities to call my friends in the VCs in Silicon Valley <laughs> and Stefan call his friends in Singapore, in London. And we call people in Singapore and say, you know, now there's what, nine unicorns in, in Seoul. Are you interested in investing? And my friend who is a former, you know, Kleiner Perkins, now managing director at Menlo Ventures says, there's 25,000 startups in Silicon Valley. You know, I don't have time. I have a great VC firm. I attract really great deals. I have none of my partners are Koreans. I don't have time to develop that market. I could, I could go to India. I could go to them. But I have so many good deals in the US. I'm, I don't have time. So I'm not doing it because I have great deals here already. I'm not going to Seoul. And what he was saying and what Balderton was saying and what John Cole Ventures is that the opposite happens, right? The John Cole Ventures... Uh, Anana Matt said, I flew to Silicon Valley every three months to say, hey, I'd love to have a relationship with you. Here's some deals from Singapore, you know? And then suddenly after three, four trips, you know, a VC says, oh yeah, I'll, I'll put some money in that company. That's very interesting. And Omer's, right? John Ruffalo did the same thing, right? It's, it's the opposite. So how do we internationalize 
the ecosystem as the VCs in the small ecosystem go and present deals, start learning what the investor in Silicon Valley is looking for and start having co-investments. And they're not gonna start investing, right? They're not gonna come and, and travel to New Zealand to invest, so it's the opposite. And then when that starts happening, then you start having relationships. So then a Silicon Valley firm does the series B. And now suddenly you have access to the global network of Menlo Ventures or, or, or Kleiner Perkins or Sequoia. Yeah, Jay, if I'm conscious, there's a couple and of other questions come in. So uh, Dan. Uh, thanks, Rosalie. Uh, kia ora, JF. Um, lovely to hear your insights. Thanks for sharing. Um, I just love the insight here about the whole ecosystem refocusing on globalization. Um, you know, I don't think you'll have any complaints from these people in this room, certainly. So just interested maybe in your experience around the leadership of that. Like, you know, is there any accelerants that you've seen at an ecosystem level that helps us get there sooner? Or does it just end up being organic and we spread the message and one at a time, you know, we start developing globalized networks? Like just thinking, and then maybe the answer is no, but is there, is there a real strong short circuit from an ecosystem perspective? I'm an entrepreneur, so I always wanted to be faster. <laughs> it's never fast enough. I work at governments, never fast enough. <laughs> so what I bring to them is how to how do you hack the system? How do you accelerate? Because if you wait for it to develop global, uh, organically, it's going to take 10 to 20 years. And you might never get there because your best resources might move to ecosystems where they have better support. Right? They might move to Sydney or they might move to the US or London. So therefore you need to do something, right? And so the government should start creating policies that help, right? So how do we create in your fund of fund a couple of firms that can play bigger, right? How do you help them, you know, get formed at uh, Kaufman Fellows so that they develop a network of VC investors from all over the world? How do you support the incubators being part of a global incubator network, the accelerators, they stop of thinking that how do you fund these accelerators so they not only can teach lean startups but actually you know make you know create those networks participate in them in a real way bring the startups outside right there's a lot that the government can do but there's all of this also the community itself can do right mm -hmm. the incubators can pick up the phone and look on the web and say oh yeah there is a clean tech incubator network that fred walty and who was at the Lacey, the LA incubator in clean tech is building. There is a network of X, Y, Z, right? I want to belong, right? And maybe I ask for money from the government or maybe just I'll, I'll pay because I know it's going to create more success. And the, and the founders need to get out of, the way, of their way. And that was the beauty of the, the, the Stockholm and the, and the Tel Aviv culture of saying, we're going to get out, right? Maybe it's the family businesses that were super successful in Sweden. And the, the, the Jewish you know, community that is really global. But when I was talking to someone built, like, doing ecosystem building in Tel Aviv a few years back, it's like, you know, you start a startup in Tel Aviv, you jump on a plane, you have an idea, you jump on a plane, you go couch surf in Silicon Valley or London for a few weeks, and you ask everybody to introduce you to people, and you see, is that a good idea? That's the first thing you do. You don't start coding. So they would take it on themselves. They would buy a flight and go do it. We can do it together as a community, uh, but we need to know that it's important and just change, right? Get out of our comfort zone. Jay, if I'm conscious of time, and thank you because this is a really generous conversation. Um, I've probably got time for just one more question. Um, a bit of a, a debate here. Actually, um, Will Charles, you've posted a good question in chat here. I'm just wondering if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah. I think for me, a lot of the conversations focus on on capital, which I think is is important. Mm. But for me, the challenge in New Zealand, I think it's in the chat, is that we have a very thin um, industrial base that is dominated by companies that are either um, pay big dividends, mature, or they're olig olig oligopolies or flat out monopolies. And seventy percent of our NZTE companies only trade in New Zealand. So we, we don't necessarily train a bunch of people who understand how to operate in large, fast growing companies. So when we get to who's going to open this, um, our sales office in Europe, or who's going to be open our sales office in the West Coast, we don't have any SVPs or VPs who can do that. <clears throat> and so our, our challenge really is over time, we need to 
import and go overseas. But I do also think we have a, a kind of an opportunity to start to think about how we grow our own capability of people who can do that. So there's a lot in there around what do we do at um, universities, what opportunities we give some of our um, more talented people um, as they're learning and developing. So having um, the startup ecosystem really engaged with our tertiary education institutes and providing um, both curricular and extracurricular things around entrepreneurship, innovation, working in teams alongside things like doing their PhDs and masters and whatever, and much more of a T-shaped education. So I think as the startup ecosystem in New Zealand to start having those conversations, because there's a lot of universities that start thinking about, you know, what, what does COVID mean to them? Um, you know, lots of things have moved off, off campus, but there are things that are off campus that, you know, you don't have a student experience, you don't make, you make friends, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of them are quite happy with that. So universities are trying to reinvent themselves about reasons to be on campus. And some of those can be around extracurricular teaching, entrepreneurship, innovation, working in teams, so on and so forth. But I think we've got a really good opportunity to work as a community in engaging with our education institutes to see, because they're looking for solutions and we can provide some. Yeah. So thank you, Will. Um, JF, just as a final summary, if there were two or three things that we need would be our call to action or your provocation to us that we need to do right now or for the next two years, what would they be? Yeah, I think for, for each stakeholder to think about what, what can they do to progress the global market reach, the global connectedness of the community, right? And so everybody has a role. And together, as we start thinking about it, as we can advocate for also policies and programs that can help us. Right? That was the that was what Tech City UK was doing. And then finally they said we need to, you know, what Will was saying at the beginning of the interventions, like we need to create executive skills and growing those startups at a functional level. Because we have nobody who's been doing it. And the few people have done it, we need them to mentor the others, right? Mm. And maybe bring mentors from executives. So that thinking in these terms is very important. And what, what does it mean for each person also to change our behavior so that we actually act in a way that, that support and spur that global thinking and that global market reach? Mm. Jay, thank you so much for your time uh, and for beaming in from the evening from San Francisco. So um, we really, really appreciate that. Thank you, Rosalie. Um, thank you, everyone. It was great to join. We do hope to... Uh, have another opportunity again in the future. So um, right. what we'd like to do now is that we're going to be creating the opportunity. Um, we'd like to welcome the panelists to this session. Um, and I'd really like just to give a very heartfelt thank you to each of the panelists that are joining us. Um, I know how incredibly busy you are. And I also know that you are all amazing ambassadors for the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, as well as being personal inspiration to me as, as both visionary leaders, but also those that have um, bring enormous warmth, empathy, and passion for Aotearoa. So we are joined by um, Suze Reynolds, who is the executive chair for the Angel Association. She's the co-founder and current director of Angel AQ and HQ, and she is also an advisor to the government on their emerging startup leadership strategy. And her real power is the passion for, or the, her passion is the power for angel investment to generate world-changing businesses. So, Suze, we'd love to just kick off to get your, just your initial thoughts on this whole theme. Yeah, can I just um, begin by... Um... Uh, saying, and um, for those of you who, um, who, and I'm not proficient in Tereo either, but I'm trying to be um, braver and more courageous in my use of it while honoring it as well. Um, that just gave you a little insight to my. Uh, my Papa Papa, which is that I, uh, my mother was a sort of Papa Papa back to South Canterbury. Uh, my family were immigrants in the 1840s 
um, and came here on a ship called the Randolph. Um, so yeah, thank you, Rosalie. This is such a neat thing um, to be doing and so wonderful to see the incredible people on this call. I'm really chuffed about that. Um, I think the things that resonated for me the most uh, in what uh, JF was talking about, and it actually stemmed right back to the six years ago or so that he mentioned that we kind of kicked this off, um, which is, was that, um, and the kudos is really belongs to Marcel van der Nassim, who's who first met JF when he was on a trip to speak to the globalization thing up to San Francisco, uh, met with JF, was impressed with what he was doing. And so he was the kind of drive behind us being part of Startup Genome in the first instance. And what came out of that for us was some really neat insights about our ecosystem, but we thought that it would be neat to bring together um, the people in the ecosystem at that point to kind of us, you know, talk about these insights together. And so we got a room full of people together at NZT, a whole bunch of people who've been sort of working in this space. And what was so gorgeous was that so many of them hadn't met each other before and they were all working in the space. It was just perfect. So for me, the connectivity piece is our big challenge um, between founders to support each other, between founders and the right investors, and between founders and the right investors and other relevant stakeholders and supporters. Um, so that is professional service providers corporate New Zealand, academia, I love Will Charles's kind of provocation that people is at the hub of it. It really truly is all about people. I believe if we fix that connectivity piece, if we get the right people connected, all those other bits that we're talking about today, capital, capability, and then the culture piece will all be solved if we, if we crack that bit. And I think to kind of drill down into that a little bit more, the solution is and partly in a national startup strategy. And Dan was raising this point in the chat too, mm -hmm. focus. We've got to get focused. And a national startup strategy, if it's going to be effective too, will be grounded in a sort of, and we don't want to get too kind of centrist about this, but having a general sense of where our strengths are and being kind of joined up about what those strengths are, because it is in focus. A small nation like us, focus is the number one principle of success. Um, yeah. So I, that's the kind of stuff I think that we're really focusing on. It's a strong kind of, um, I guess, Kaupapa for the Angel Association, connectivity, joining us all together. And we can maybe dig into that a little bit more when we get into our breakout session. But I hope that gives you a little bit of a sense of where I think we should be getting. Cheers, Rosalie. If I could, if I could just ask, what's, what are you asking for in the startup strategy? What are the key things you're recommending? Um, well, we need for, for a start off, and you mentioned this too in your introduction, a sense of what success looks like. Um, and there are some sort of broader tenets to that. And I love your whole um, creating exponential value and impact that's grounded in deep empathy for people and the planet. I think that's a really strong sort of Kiwi thing that we all uh, can be very, very proud of. I think that's our secret source. Um, and I think we owe a lot of um, gratitude and thanks to, to our Māori and, and our Indigenous people for that kaitiakitanga, manakitanga, uh, all of those things are really, really important. And they go, and they're not just things to use most slightly technical term that are nanga nanga, but soft. They're actually really solid uh, value drivers and creators. If you're creating empathy, you're really sussing out and you're using empathy, you're really sussing out where the value is. But to get a bit more sort of granular and I guess specific about that, we need some clear targets. So we have talked about creating sort of five to 10,000 startups in the next five years. Um, and keeping a bead on you know, where the job creation is and where the focus and strengths are for us. Um, and I think we're small enough that we can have a sort of, again, a light touch national startup strategy um, and national start startup portfolio so that we know who they all are and we can join the dots. That connectivity um, piece, again, is really, really important. Um, and really owning it, actually really genuinely recognizing that our future job growth that all the big problems that we're facing in the world are being solved by startups and really kind of helping us to kind of button into that. Being a startup founder is incredibly freaking brave. So those yeah. founders need our support way more, helping them to be brave, helping them to be ambitious, helping them to go global and find the right people. Mm. So Suze, like, um, what I'm hearing there is that our three key levers from your perspective really are around that, uh, that connectivity it's around and, and getting the right, it's getting um, the vision and some clear targets, and then it's real united focus to yeah. actually get behind and to drive for this next stage. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to Anna Komenik. So Anna is currently the Asia Pacific Region Director of WISC New Zealand. And 
WISC is a United States, New Zealand advanced aviation company that is bringing to market one of the world's first autonomous electric air taxis. Um, and it was really a forerunner, I guess, for, for our advanced aviation and aerospace industry. Anna has a real portfolio background, having served two prime ministers in New Zealand and a former Commonwealth secretary, and has also founded her own businesses. She is also, I'm delighted to say, the new board <laughs> chair of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, so Anna, just love to get your initial thoughts because you'll bring a different perspective. Uh, in a mana, in a rail, in a karanga, maha ope wa, tenakoto katoa, kota ahama rangi in tamanga, a ko karimako to awa, ko nati hurai at the iwi, no ponaki o, ke whisk, a mahi ana, ko anakamanak toko ingoa, a no rera, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Um, it is an absolute privilege uh, to be here today uh, speaking both as chair of uh, EHF, just started, so please give me some grace um, as I get up to speak with an extraordinary team uh, that I'm privileged to be part of, uh, but also uh, as part of my role with um, uh, WISC as Asia Pacific Director. Um, I think as, uh, as you've said and as the speakers have so, uh, so aptly said um, previously, um, there is uh, an enormous opportunity for New Zealand from, from for Aotearoa, from my perspective. Uh, we're small, but we're mighty. And I think one of the things that I have learned very much, uh, both in doing startups in New Zealand, but also now having a, the, a very sort of privileged position in the fact that uh, WISC is an investment into New Zealand, which is quite, mm. uh, it's a new start of a new uh, wave of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship where uh, outside in innovation wants to come to New Zealand to actually develop, go to market and work, go out back to the globe. Uh, from New Zealand. And that gives us a different perspective again from uh, just growing from startups to scale up. Uh, so it's a slightly different approach. I think from what I've learned uh, in my current role uh, is that we have some distinct advantages in New Zealand that uh, we can really uh, leverage, grow, develop, uh, sustain. Uh, and they are going to give us a real advantage uh, in all of this space. Uh, and what does that mean specifically? That's around the fact that we um, have a fantastic reg regulatory environment. It's very easy to think, get things done in New Zealand. Uh, we have a very progressive, generally, government, um, no matter which flavor it is. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, community spirit. We have a, a strong sense of diversity uh, that helps with your product growth, your product development, because what you're actually doing is you're speaking to your future customers and that development, that diversity in the development actually creates a better product and we that was a um, unintended consequence uh, of whisks coming to New Zealand was they suddenly realized this diversity this the different voices that uh, were part of uh, the New Zealand environment was starting to really add value to the product development itself uh, and the other side is actually our, our people so we talked a little bit, um, I know that Will was talking a little bit about uh, what is the people capital side of this. We're generalists in New Zealand. So that actually has a huge advantage to international companies who are looking to go back out into the globe because the way that we approach relationships, that tolerance, the listening, uh, actually helps us to uh, grow things faster. We develop relationships very quickly. And what we've mm. found is that um, our American colleagues actually leverage that very heavily, uh, particularly into the Asia Pacific, as the New Zealandness has huge brand value uh, in, in making those um, specific connections. Um, I mean, if I was to kind of lump things together, um, I think in the post COVID environment, we've got to understand that every decision that we're making right now um, is actually impacting on our future in 20 years' time. Um, and we have to be very deliberative about the decisions we're making, whether it's around our uh, border or whether it's about uh, which industries we're supporting at this time. Whatever it is, we've got to be thinking about this as a conscious decision for our future um, 
well-being, innovation, and economy. Um, you know, I think there's an aspect around, and I know that I'm sure Francis will talk about the pipeline of talent. Are we taking mm -hmm. science seriously enough? Um, and are we taking innovation seriously enough uh, at our school level? Um, uh, that connect and collaborate, which um, you know I'm I'm very passionate about, and which obviously Dave was talking about, is not just about internationalizing our opportunities, but how do we actually get a little bit more aggressive about that? So I've been working a lot with WISC in Australia and uh, learning a lot about how uh, they really do fight to win. Um, and I feel like sometimes with New Zealanders, we're a little bit uh, earnest and we sometimes stand back and don't always, it's that parochialism factor. Um, and we don't always, um, you know, really back ourselves, understand that sometimes there's a little bit of veneer and marketing in this space. You always have to be authentic, but let's not, we don't have to be 110% before we actually say we're good. We can actually go out there. Um, I have a little bit of an analogy that I see quite often with some of the um, smaller aerospace companies in New Zealand who are literally growing up under the wings of Rocket Lab, ourselves, Dawn Aerospace is a Believe it or not, New Zealand is number 11 in terms of aerospace uh, in the world uh, and growing really fast. Uh, so we've got a real opportunity there. But with those companies, they're still not pushing hard enough. They're not pushing themselves out to go to JS Point. They're not going out there and actually demanding that attention, demanding uh, those collaborations with ourselves. Um, you know, we're happy to take them and tuck them under our wings as we go to things like commotion in LA right now or wherever it might be. So really driving home those collaborations. And then the other thing that's really um, high on my list is valuing knowledge. Um, so really understanding the value of what New Zealand is bringing. Um, IP. Yeah. We should be embedding IP in New Zealand, regardless of whether it's an innovation coming to New Zealand or uh, whether it's New Zealand companies. Um, we tend to allow that to go. Uh, or, so we don't, we don't hold on to that. We don't clip the ticket all the way through. And to go to JF's point, we, you know, that, that would make a New Zealand company always a New Zealand company because the IP would be there. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think there's some really tangible things we can do to make sure that we retain value, really own our value in the startup ecosystem. Uh, we are a wonderful proof of concept or proof of, um, you know, of how to do things in New Zealand. Uh, the reason WISC is here is because we can show that what we're doing will work in any city by actually working with cities in New Zealand. So that is globally applicable uh, and we're already leveraging that. So yeah, I think it's that small but mighty and let's make sure we, we value ourselves properly. That's, that's really powerful, Anna. And I think very relevant for a lot of our fellows who are international and looking at bringing their businesses here. And what I'm hearing is that there is not only the potential to bring a business here and use it as a test bed, but also to play a very active role within developing the ecosystem here and, ensure, and driving value back into the international business from New Zealand that's quite unique. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I, I do believe that. Um, I do think that um, understanding that actually there is, there is value for, I mean, we could, be, we could be attracting way more business into New Zealand as part of that. You can come here, you can develop. I'm not gonna say research and develop, because uh, like Suze, I feel like we just don't really do that particularly well yet, um, but we can develop, we can go to market, show a proof of concept, and then send it back out into the world. And that's okay. What we need to do is embed those benefits into New Zealand on the way through, so that our other companies are growing, scaling, getting the uh, experience and innovation that they need to uh, succeed. Anna, thank you. Um, now, just a reminder to everyone, you will get an opportunity um, to ask questions, to um, 
share your thoughts on, on this. I now like to turn to Francis Valentine. Um, Francis is, has had a long history has, um, with uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship, has supported us throughout, has been part of the selection crew for many of the fellows. Um, she's an awarded technologist and educator and is the founder and chief executive of Mind Lab and Tech Futures Lab. Her passion is really about providing learning pathways for educators and pro professionals to understand the impact of emerging technologies and then the cultural adaptation that is required to really embrace change. Um, so Francis, welcome. I know you'll bring a different perspective because you really take the whole um, whole of country view. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Francis Valentine Aho. It is a great pleasure to be here. And I first of all want to acknowledge the, my fellow panelists, some of my favourite people in, in the community. So great to be sharing the stage, this virtual stage with you. And I also just want to acknowledge um, Annie Uesi, who's on the call as well. When she's C cohort eight, and she is actually joining me for a class in half an hour in disruptive technology. So I have to leave at 4.30, so so does she. <laughs> um, so I, I still live in the world where I still do teach uh, and, and I love it. So my um, view is very much through an education lens. I, I fell into education as a technologist uh, over 20 years ago and I've never left because I feel the job is still not done. And, um, and I have had the view through working on the board of Callahan Innovation for many years, looking at the R&D environment up until last year when I stepped off and of course with EHF. But most of my time is running graduate school for professionals. And, and just if you don't know uh, the organizations, for context, the students we have, and we have thousands of students, they are professionals with the average age of 44. Um, mostly they come out of large organizations and are really trying to discover where directionally they're heading in, in their careers. And so this is really a, a view I've taken across multiple countries and working living across, across the ecosystem and thinking about startups. And coming back into Aotearoa and looking through that lens of what people think about startups, I recognize the first and foremost, it's a very exclusive club. And it's a hard thing to say, but actually we, we exclude the, the, the really the, the core values of Aotearoa because the aspirational pieces and components that we put forward as the characteristics of a startup uh, founder are often look nothing like our community. And I think we're really missing the fact that our country is a very diverse country, our cities even more so. We have a rich history and, and the influence of Te Ao Māori. We have a Pacifica flavor. We have a large immigration community, which is one of the most diverse uh, cities or countries in the world. And actually, we really have to understand what is in the heart of people when they think about startups. And if you go deep into the school system, you very quickly identify that there is really no visibility of a culture around people creating their own destiny, becoming entrepreneurs, becoming startups. And even to the point of understanding the difference between a traditional analog organization and a, and a digitally uh, informed and scalable organization. So by the time I meet these students as adults who have many decades often in, in experience, they too have no understanding of what the startup community really looks like because it's ring fenced by a certain terminologies and often by connections into the, the likes of venture capital and partners and VCs and it's just an unfamiliar terrain. So I think we do need to be very careful that we don't become even further ex sort of exclusive to uh, the rich, richness of what Aotearoa can bring. So that's the first part. The second one, our economic complexity is very low in, in terms of as a metric, what we're producing is not unique. We're not, uh, the, the high levels of innovation we perhaps, where we peaked over 20 years ago, are declining as we are not really embracing those things that we're extraordinarily good at, or we have a natural unfair advantage. And I do hear and see more and more people aspiring to be like something else, as, a, as opposed to what is intrinsically our unfair advantage, what could we do, how do we harness it, and how do we bring the components that make us significantly different from other markets and that we can scale in a different way. The, the challenge we, that goes deeper into the system though is people don't know what they don't know. And mm -hmm. I think this is one of the greatest challenges we have. 
And if I look at uh, the, the issues we have around R&D, the lack of maturity of understanding the benefits of research and development uh, permeates all the way through the system and even in, right through into education. So just to give you a, a bit of a, a taste of New Zealand. So less than 5% of New Zealanders have any form of postgraduate qualification. Now that is the lowest in the OECD. Now that's where, and you go into postgraduate studies is where you learn to research. It's where you learn to experience, experiment. It's where you start to actually have a hypothesis and think about how things can be possible. It's where you mix with other people from different disciplines and you bring that convergent space together. So in the absence of really pushing people into the spaces where education is a lifelong pursuit and actually engaging with parts of the ecosystem within education, within the startup ecosystems, within different communities, it's really hard to imagine that diversity that's going to spark the startups that we need to scale and, and to grow. So, so one is how do we get people involved with learning across their life? And so it's not that, that part of a sort of a front loading experience that we do early on and then we kind of forge ahead and trade on things that perhaps uh, no longer fit for purpose and uh, and I think that given a small size of our uh, our population the number one employer is the government the number two employer is yourself the number three employer is typically international companies 50 50 percent of all of our companies in New Zealand are offshore owned so we have to understand we're getting down to a very small segment. By the time you take out local councils, you're actually getting down to a private sector that is predominantly focused on small businesses. How do we get those people to understand the potential opportunity of growth? And if they're not surrounded by people who talk about investment, if they're not surrounded by people who understand by the, the money you invest in the time and the research, the exponential benefits that can come with that, we keep talking to the same people. And I think it's really critical that we try to understand we have talent, we have incredible talent, we have great creativity, we've got great perspectives from different cultures and we have a, a fairly egalitarian community, which means that ideas can bubble around without a huge hierarchy because of complexity and, and big businesses. So then what is missing is understanding of what startup ecosystems need and also what they look like. So I'm a really big um, in favor of this idea that we need to permeate that storytelling. And, and actually I think of one of the other parts of storytelling is um, goes even deep into to journalism. It's if you think about the sources of information that people now uh, gravitate towards, if you take a, a Washington Post or a New York Times, or you, you look at even, even across the ditch of the Australian and you look at the caliber of the storytelling about startups and, and technologies and the advancement of, of you know, different types of tech. And then you pick up local media. It's really hard to see you know, where are those businesses here where they don't get become front page news. We don't see the great, you know, the really great success stories that we are incubating or we, we have you know, we've populated and pushed into the world. And it's, I think as part of that too, we have to have those deeper conversations and depth of understanding of what is actually happening behind closed doors or in offshore markets that's been sort of spurred and spawned and grown from Aotearoa's kind of heart. So there's the, all the ingredients for me are, are all there, but the links are not. The connections mm -hmm. are frail. And, and actually, we, when we think about how we might build those ecosystems and connect them, we just need to make sure that there's no missing pieces. You know, if you, if you think about the connections and the chain that we need, um, as soon as there's a broken link, the system breaks completely. And I think that's where we are right now. And COVID, of course, with two years of slowdown, uh, is going to actually exacerbate some of these issues. So we need a to have a gear change and, and put the foot on the accelerator. And we need to kind of hustle people together and, and get going again, but maybe reimagining with other people at the table. So if there were three things or two things that we could do to move it forward, what would it be? Um, I think the big one is that visibility. You know, let's, yep. let's talk about our heroes. Let's talk about the people who carved the way over the generations and who are now storytelling the today. Tell the stories, yep. make them, but make sure they're representative of the communities that, that our hero is. So that people can, the relatability I think is really critical and uh, tell those stories within the school and education system as well, throughout the whole system. 
Um, and I think the other one is uh, going back to that point I made around, uh, you know, do what you're good at. And actually we need to define, and I know uh, Rosalie, we worked together with Callahan, you know, so Paul Callahan kept saying, we need to do the weird things. You know, the things that nobody else wants to do, the things that are you know unique because we can do them in small scale, but we can sell them at high prices. And we, you know, we, we, we've got to lose this obsession with doing things like other people are and really focus on those things, which perhaps are a little bit weird and a little bit niche, but actually done beautifully and can scale um, because nobody else wants to touch them because of scale. That'd be the two. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now just turning to our, um, uh, our fourth panellist, Aubrey Tekanua. Aubrey, you bring a really special um, perspective to this, really keen to hear your thoughts from the perspective of the Māori um, startup system. Well, kia ora, Rosalie. Uh, Kari te maunga, whangarua te moana. Uh, my name is Ruby Tikanua. Kariwa is my mountain. Raglan is my moana. Um, and um, also from uh, Ngati Manyapoto as well. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be on, uh, on the call and um, obviously acknowledge a few people out in the audience that have seen their name come up on the, on the comments. Um, and just to acknowledge everyone that's spending their time on this, on this uh, quarter. Uh, so my, my perspective is. Um, much the same as Francis is coming from an education perspective. Um, so for the last two years, been running the Kōkiri Māori Business Accelerator, uh, and that's focused is, is, is the first Indigenous focused um, accelerator in New Zealand. And at the time um, we went over to the Global Accelerator Network in, in Denver, we found out that we were probably one of the only ones, if the only ones that that we knew of in the entire Global Accelerator Network. So um, it, was, it was really interesting, um, I suppose, perspective to compare us globally um, going over there. But um, in terms of, like, I've looked at, you know, the Aroha Mai run, I was a late ringin. Um, I'm a substitute, so getting across the material, I haven't prepared at all, so I'm just going to wing this. Um, <laughs> but I can only speak about the perspective of looking at the Māori startup ecosystems and what I saw while I was running Kōkiri. So one of the first things is, um, if I start with capability, uh, the founders that we got through, um, they need a lot of capability development. So while we're wanting to accelerate them to, to then um, scale internationally, the reality is we're, we're back at grassroots level and we actually had to take a step back and work on development of people as founders. And what that meant was we had to change the program. So 50% of it was actually focused on human skills how to relate to team members, how to manage your emotions, because the entrepreneurial story is, it's, it's pretty tough. So if you're not built for entrepreneurialism, um, you know, it could be pretty rough. So half our program was on human skills, uh, which was kind of different, I suppose, from how it's normally done, maybe, I don't know. But that's where we ended up. Um, so from, a, from, from that, that perspective, you know, I hear, hear people talk about, oh, you know, we've got all these great scientists and there's research and development. There's all this cool stuff. Really, in the Māori ecosystem, we're a step behind that. So um, most of the people that we see are actually SMEs. Um, you know, and, and then a small percentage of that would be ready for, say, an accelerator program. And, and so when, when um, JF was talking about global connectivity, I actually have the opposite view. While that's important, where the Māori ecosystem is, we actually need local connectivity. Um, that you know that that's sort of, sort of foundation layer that you can build the global connectivity on. So I went around and actually talked to about forty different people in the Māori startup ecosystem. None of them were in accelerators or incubators. These are people that work to develop other startups. It's like this massive underground black market of people trying to help startups get going, and most of the time they're doing it voluntarily, not not really well funded, sporadic funding. Um, and are just doing it out of love. But that is the, that's the Māori startup ecosystem, and that's the one that I'm curious about how we build that, because if that, that layer is there, then there's, there's room to make the step up and start building the next layer up. Um, so, but the, the issue I found is they're not really well connected. So mm -hmm. that, that connectivity piece is, 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 is actually needed. And um, stepping back to a grassroots level, not worrying about 
you know, scaling internationally and all that, just get the baseline level stuff done first. Um, the next one on the list was the, oh, I think I've covered off capability and next one's connection. Um, so the connectivity, like local, uh, I'm gonna talk about capital. There's a lot of capital out there. Like, and um, we had someone actually map on, on, you know, the old startup growth curve where all the capital was along that curve. And there's actually quite a lot in the early stage. And then as you go up, there's, there's people there that will fund startups at different stages. None of that capital is connected into the Māori community. We'll just let that sit. Mm. So it's not connected. The capital is there, but it's not connected. Um, and the second part of it is it's actually culturally not appropriate, some of it. Because you're asking, um, you know, you get people that, that they're really committed in, to their kaupapa. They, they're, they're doing something that's impactful. They love it. And they're not going to, they're not going to exit. So how do you tell that to an investor that wants to have an exit at point X? So then, okay, if that's the case, then who's the right investors? Or maybe do we have to do some cultural training on, 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 on that capital so that they will invest in stuff that, where people have like a hundred year time frame? So um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I don't have an answer for it, but um, that, that was my observations around the capital. Um, in terms of culture, I'm gonna to touch on this one, is um, obviously some cultural differences. And I think the younger generation are probably more attuned with, with Māori values and, and frameworks. Like you talk about manaki tanga and kaitiaki tanga, just about every young person wants those things. They're, they're in tune. Um, yeah, so but the challenge that we had a lot of the time was actually getting our entrepreneurs to think about making money, to, to make sure that the business stays sustainable. <laughs> um, because they're so focused in on the co that they're, they're not thinking about the, the business model. Um, and, and one of the things I've ne uh, observed as well, and I, I think if you work in indigenous spaces, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about, but it's, it's uh, we talk, term, term it white knight syndrome where people will come into your community from overseas, they've got all these great skills, um, but they're basically it's like, like, here I am, I am your champion, follow me, natives. Um, so just to give you a story, is, is like, I moved back to Raglan several years ago to, to work on our land block and build a papakainga. It took me three years to build up enough trust with my own people that I was there to actually do some good work. Mm. And it took yeah, three years and, and they knew who I was. So imagine you're coming from outside and you're saying, you know, hey, I can, I can solve all these problems for you and I'm gonna do it in a year. Like people go, oh yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> so um, that, that's probably something to watch. Mm. You know, and, and just know that the Māori ecosystem can sniff those people out pretty quickly. Um, and then um, probably the, the, to answer your question before you ask it is, you know, what, what, are, the three, what are my three things? So the first thing is um, the connectivity, local connectivity. So if you, if you were to somehow link up all of the people working in the startup ecosystem on some sort of combined strategy um, where they're not fighting for the same RFPs and they're able to co collaborate, that would be awesome. Um, and then, you know, a, a, an environment where I'm able to share um, IP around how to develop startups with everybody else and we're sharing knowledge. Um, because in the Māori startup ecosystem, a simple concept like validation is not well known. Mm. So, so how do you talk about building an ecosystem when you don't have the baseline knowledge? So that has to get spread throughout the entire ecosystem. Everyone needs to be on the same page. Um, so local connectivity is the first one. The second one is uh, programmatic. So you think about if you want to build a culture where entrepreneurialism is, you know, throughout the entire country and it's normal and stock standard, uh, I'll use the analogy of the All Blacks. So you think about the All Blacks, they're a unicorn sports team, 77% win record over 100 years. To get the All Blacks, there's a bunch of stuff below that, starting at, you know, Ripper Rugby and going all the way up to schoolboy rugby, then to club rugby and NPC and Super 12. There's volunteers, there's referees, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that goes into building that one unicorn. And if you apply that to the startup space, it's actually not, not that different. 
but we don't have all of those steps in, in, in the ladder to build that, that unicorn group. Um, so for me, the focus is bottom rung, baseline infrastructure, Ripper Rugby, number one. Get that in place first and also making it accessible. Um, yeah. Because, for example, if you think about what, what, what do you have at schools uh, for entrepreneurialism? Then you think, well, okay, what do you have at high schools for entrepreneurialism? Then you think, okay, now this is for me, for, for Māori people, after high school, how many of those people are going to universities and getting access to, you know, the programs that are run through universities? So um, there, there's a bit of a gap. Um, and, and then you think about that from an infrastructure perspective, you need to have all that stuff before you can start expecting startups to churn out at a regular rate. And um, in terms of the pro programmatic stuff, I also think there needs to be massive work done on mindset. It's, it's, especially in COVID times, it's made people more conscious about human skills, um, being able to handle stress, um, mm -hmm. be able to uh, manage relationships, which is much harder when you're doing it via Zoom, which is kind of the norm nowadays. Um, so programmatically, you need you know, all the accelerators and incubators um, helping their entrepreneurs become good humans at the same time that they're, they're stepping out in, into the world. And I think that could be a real difference for us as New Zealanders if we're focused on, on humans, developing good humans that be, then become good businesses and good role models, you know, you'll build that culture over time. Um, and what else was the, uh, one more note. Uh, yeah, local connectivity, programs that are good. Oh, and also then there's some policy stuff as well. If you want that sort of infrastructure, you have to have policies that incentivize that stuff to happen. You can't incentivize people to be connected when you're putting in into a competitive RFP. That's not going to happen. So the, the RFPs have to be worked in such a way as you're encouraging um, collaboration uh, in terms of the accelerators and incubators. But th those things are key pieces of infrastructure for developing the next layer of um, startups. Uh, that's Aubrey, my rant, you. I think. <laughs> All right. Actually, that was incredibly revealing. Thank you so much. Those insights are really, really valuable um, and much appreciated. So we'd just like to open up to questions now. Um, I know there's been quite a live commentary that's been going on in chat. Um, so any questions that you've got or else putting up your hand if you have any sort of questions for the panelists at this point. While we're waiting, I think I've probably got one question that is going to be burning on my mind, which is, um, I know we've got Harve, Ian Harvey. Let's throw to you. You can come, to, I can ask my question later. Kia ora, Aubrey, love to see you. Uh, Kia ora, Harve. I knew you were going to uh, ask a question. Yeah, look, <laughs> Aubrey, you make it sound easy uh, in some respects from it can be really challenging for us Pākehā to step into your world, right? And it's it's a really interesting dynamic doing that. And uh, thanks to your spooky sister, I've had to do it a few times. But what's what advice for us coming into your world, that those first steps, how do we do it? Ooh. You had to ask a tough question, didn't you? Um, I'm not sure if you're making any, it. You're making it look too easy. Well, I don't know if I've got, got any good advice on the spot, but probably the first thing is just to listen. Um, I'll give you an example. I, I met this person, and they came came to me and I said, oh, "You know, I want to do this stuff in the startups world. You know, help help Māori businesses and stuff like that." And then. Um, I, I never know what people's true intentions are, so I just sat back and waited for a year to see what, what would roll and um, watched this person over the space of a year bust a whole bunch of relationships. And, you know, that was enough. So the evidence was in the actions, but just listening and actually being considered in actions and knowing, you know, not, try, you know, not trying to put um, a lens on what you see, just, just listening and observing, that's probably the biggest thing. In fact, in our program, listening skills is rated as the number one human skill. 
So yeah, just listening. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, hands coming up for any of the panelists? So look, the question that I, I have, because we're talking here about local and global connectivity, we're talking about skills and capability, we're talking about culture. What's your provocation or ask of the Edmund Hillary Fellows, given that they bring, they are serial entrepreneurs, they are investors, they have global expertise, they have experience in scaling up systems. My provocation and my ask of the panelists is, what should we be doing in these next two years to really help to mature this ecosystem? Is, is, is that for me or is that for everyone? Or? That's for all. It's so easy, Rosalie. You know, hearts <laughs> is just bubbling out of all of us. <laughs> I think we have just, I think there's, I loved um, Aubrey's thing about just listen. Um, but I think um, I also love the Chinese philosopher dude Lasso, who he talks about you start small, you know, um, start and I like the kind of um, start local. I really loved Aubrey's kind of thing about just um, build trust, you know, like home first, build connections at home first. And so mm. where I think, um, you know, Edmund Hillary fellows can really help is, I mean, you'd be brave about making those initial initial connections, you know, one on one small groups. Um, if you see a startup that appeals, if you see an initiative that appeals, New Zealand is so sort of hyper-connected that ask any of us here and within two sendings of an email, we can probably join some dots for you. So I'd encourage them just to have at that because I think, Harv, your question, it can be daunting coming into a new hood where you don't know anyone and where the culture seems quite kind of quite powerful and people use jingo and la and jargon that kind of can be also a little bit off-putting. So um, I just encourage you to kind of reach out. Start small. Francis, I'm conscious of your time. I'd love to get your final thoughts. I think that the the, the key the, the key thoughts, I think first of all, this is great this conversation is taking place. I think the more we have these conversations, the more we have a, a global group of people coming together to make those connections, the better it's going to become. I just wish it was ampl amplified. And I think there's been some great comments in the chat and coming back to just reporting and storytelling that I still think that, that if, we could, if we can get our stories more able to be uh, consumed by a, a broader group of the community, people who are running small businesses, who have got aspirations mm -hmm. and, and people in the regions and people who you know, have seen the potential of what they've got, but they just don't know where to start. If we can find a way to connect with those people, and we'll probably discover there's a whole lot of untapped uh, capability and innovation and just original thinking that we haven't seen at all yet. Um, and that's what the whole country was, you know, really built upon, that, that kind of that pioneering, really strong creativity. And I think we've lost a little bit of that. And I think we'd love to see it come back and make sure that it's in its own flavor, distinctly from here. Thank you. We have a question from Mark Brinkman. It, it's actually a little bit of a follow on to the earlier discussion that we were having about how to connect the different um, families. So we have the Maori, we have the Pakeha, we have the people like me that are really neither, we come from the outside. And I think that this discussion about listening and hearing is, is at the center of it. There's a, I just wanted to recommend a book, Following on Suze Reynolds, who recommended some ancient book. This one is not quite as ancient. It's called On Dialogue. It's written by Daniel Bohm, who's a physicist. That's how I know him. He's passed away. But he really put, spent a lot of time thinking about how to bring different groups together uh, through communication. And his book On Dialogue is a, is a very structured way to think about it. And I think it's uh, really valuable and something that maybe within uh, EHF, we ought to, lots of people should read it because I think it's relevant to a lot of what we do uh, in bringing the whole fellowship together and then integrating the fellowship into New Zealand and helping also pull together the different uh, sort of constituent parts of New Zealand. Thank you. AJ. 
And look, I, we'll have to farewell um, Frances. She has to go and teach her class in literally two minutes. So um, really delighted that she took this time with us. Um, AJ. Thanks, Rosalie. Um, yeah, actually, I was responding a little bit to, to the question you asked um, around what, what can the unique positioning be for, for the fellowship and for the Edmund Hillary mm -hmm. Institute and fellowship. Um, and I think it's bouncing off a lot of the comments we've heard from Francis and from everybody today that um, to me, if I would ask that question, it would be the fellowship can be the living, breathing example of what happens when you have an entrepreneurial ecosystem that's focused on impact. Mm -hmm. um, I think coming back to what we were talking about narratives and about why isn't New Zealand as a culture responding to, certain, to, to the entrepreneurship and the startup proposition. I think it's because we're, we're telling the wrong narratives. We're, we're trying to bang square pegs into round holes. Kiwi culture isn't good at responding to my PL as my global score. And this is, I just need to get a higher and higher one. We kind of have this, this com comfort dynamic, the traditional boat batch and BMW. We want to have a level of comfort, but we don't seem to have this constant appetite for increasing our personal score. But we do have this constant appetite for having greater and greater impact. If we can if we can refocus the New Zealand startup proposition around, this is the place where startups don't just start up and become successful in fiscal terms. This is the place where startups start up and become successful in solving challenges, meeting problems, overcoming hurdles, solving global problems. Just refocusing, not just the ecosystem but then the narratives that generate that ecosystem around impact again i've spent a lot of time warping young minds as well just um trying to teach high school kids quantum mechanics and watching them all fall down it's quite fun but i don't see any of them respond to go start up a company because then you'll get fantastically wealthy but i see a lot of them saying how do i solve, solve this problem there's this global issue out there whether it's i don't know tigers are dying or water is dirty or climate change obviously and they're all asking how do i solve the problem and there's a disconnect between you know what the way you can solve the problem is by a really successful startup that's impact driven so coming back to the cohort and the fellowship you're 90 percent of the way there in your language anyway global impact visa impact driven organization be the standard bearer for it you know just stand up and you know i know there's a keynote out there and stuff like that but be the standard bearer for this is what happens when you build an entrepreneurial ecosystem around core foundation of impact, oh, and by the way, you'll get wealthy because that's what happens if you succeed. Can I just to back to that? That's super cool. Because and and also acknowledging EHF for a program that we've just done, which was the Abroad Wellbeing program with about 40, 50 founders and investors. And part of that was um, trying to, uh, you know, um, focused on well-being and and letting founders know that it's okay to fail and that they're human, you know, all of us for that matter. You know, Anna out of it and the comment about, you know, the fear of failure is still a real handbrake in New Zealand. The fear of, I mean, I put it slightly more crassly, fear of looking like a dick. Um, and I think it's partly because we're still still a little small, a little village-like, you, you want to belong, you don't want to stand out too much. But if we can build a community, which was so gorgeous this morning, we had a sort of farewell wrap up of the abroad program, 40 or 50 of us, and it was just um, asks and offers. And man, it was powerful in terms of the number of people who said, I now realize I'm not alone in this and trying to be brave and wanting to save, you know, save the world. It's okay to want to have a huge impact um, and, and supporting and letting it be okay for us to have a crack and not make it. Oh, my goodness. Um, thank you, AJ. That's a really good point. Mm. Thank you. Look, I am conscious of time. What do you think, Michelle? Have we got time for one more? Yeah, I think so. Well, we've got, how's in everyone's energy levels? Everyone's still pretty good? Yeah, we've got some amazing panels here. So I think we should just keep this going. We can do another <laughs> couple. Yep. So I know that there's a lot of, now, Harv, you've still got your hand up. Do you have another question? I do, but I'm happy to defer if there's somebody else on the line. Go ahead. So I'm interested in, uh, to the whole panel, Pity Francis is gone, but the rise of DAOs in the, in the world, how do you see that impacting the, um, the, the startup space?
sorry, I might not have heard the question. What, what, the rise of... Sorry. Of DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, how do you see that impacting their impact space? The startup space. I kind of, I'm not particularly scared about it, actually. <laughs> um, but that's maybe because I quite like chaos. Um, look, I, um, I'll, I'll let the other panelists go for it and then come back to that. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, it's not a concept that I'm terribly familiar with. I really love the sound of it. Um, <laughs> and, um, it, you know, so love to learn more. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I just think it's going to be huge in the Māori space, Aubrey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think I think Māori are going to get on to this. Um, and it's basically, it is just motivating the crowd and having multiple stakeholders instead of one. Exactly. So it's, a, it's, it's the opposite of the old capitalist system. Yeah. And 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 coming with a whole new ownership structure and involvement. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'm really I'm really interested. In it. I think it's going to be. And I I'm really I talked to Che Wilson last week, Aubrey, and going. You need to get up to date with this because it's coming. And I think you guys are going to be great with it. I also think there's a piece that I you know some of the people on the call will have heard me say a lot before too. In the same way that it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a whole country to raise a startup. And that is professional service providers, the government, academia, NZ corporate, we all have to kind of wrap the love around that um, and help them to succeed. And all have to take a kind of, I mean, I don't mean to this to sound quite so messy around, but a sort of portfolio approach to it. You know, we all have a stake in helping our startup ecosystem to thrive. And it's not either is it a sort of classic government intervention logic either you sort of write and fix an intervention and then fix a problem and then write out again we've got to be in this for the next forever right um because it's it's hard mahi um and and lots of people will fail if we're doing it right but fail in a well supported additive kind of fashion that's how we learn um for goodness sake yeah have i think um from my perspective i think um uh, there are some moves. I mean, it is a it's a it's a different kind of structure, right? And it is devolved. And I do agree that um, it's going to take a wee while for your um, your your more traditional uh, funding structures to kind of catch up because it looks really messy <laughs> when you're mm -hmm. having a look at the mm -hmm. uh, look at the books. Um, but from my perspective, I think it's a hugely exciting, and and particularly as you say, uh, where you have particularly for Indigenous. Uh, um, peoples, it's I know in, in Canada they're looking at it really strongly. Uh, so look, I think it's got huge potential. It's just you know we will see it evolve over time, and I hope that it's given the space and and breathing space to actually evolve into something positive because I think it's got a lot of spillover into the mainstream. I mean. We uh, were in a conversation with LA City about um, devolved ownership uh, of some of the transport systems, particularly into hard to reach areas. And um, there was a couple of organizations that were looking for community, basically, it's basically a DAO. So, uh, and they were looking for government to actually support that. And I suspect that that's probably where it's going to start potentially. I know there's some talk about, um, you know, whether it's uh, going to be more of a cryptocurrency or a crowdsourcing type approach for, to funding. But I do think there is uh, where you're seeking, it's almost like an evolution of community-led development to that next phase. I, I'd love your view on that. Um, but I think there's huge potential and particularly in a New Zealand context. Okay, everyone, um, I'm conscious of time. Um, I do want to say a huge thank you because this has been a really interesting and a really engaging session. Um, we're getting a lot of messages from people who are saying, I'm really sorry that I've, I've got to go right now. Um, I just did have, and I just wanted to um, throw something at Anna with her EHF board hat on. And I just wanted to, just for to share while we still had this group together, Sure. where you believe the opportunity is for EHF next year, for the fellowship next year? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, forgive me, I'm two weeks into, into the role, but one thing um, I would love to see us discussing more around is connect connectivity. Uh, so how do we not only internationalise, but also build those connections, both in New Zealand and Aotearoa, but also outside 
uh, what is a practical way to do that? What are some ways that we can work with other organisations like SUSE's, uh, like others that are on the call uh, to actually maximise that? So we don't even just think about our own organisation, but we're also thinking out outside of that. What is um, the specific, I guess, what is, um, to use horrible marketing language, what is the EHF value proposition in terms of the collective impact? What does that actually mean? What are we actually holding ourselves to? What will be different as a result of our actions in 12 months time? I would like to give us that challenge to actually set ourselves something concrete to have challenged and changed uh, over 12 months time. Um, and then I do want to uh, really see how we can, um, I guess, think about um, valuing knowledge. Uh, what are the aspects of uh, knowledge that sits within our own organization and the, the wonderful people that we have? What are the aspects of that knowledge that we should be bringing to New Zealand? And then how do we value the knowledge that we have in New Zealand? How do we match that? So. Uh, if we look at our distinct uh, culture in New Zealand, uh, te ao Māori is a very, very important, um, I would say it's a lesson, it's a piece of knowledge that we have in New Zealand that actually creates a better world, um, that long-term thinking, relationship-based, as Aubrey so articulately put, mm -hmm. it is about not doing things in a transactional and fast way, but listening understanding what you don't know, and then starting to explore that white space between uh, and not being afraid of that. Because once you start to do that, not only is your business better, not only is your product better, but I sincerely believe, um, you know, our, our communities and our society is better. Great. Thank you so much. So look, we're, we're going to go to a... Um, a short break now and then there's the opportunity to come back we've got the sessions that are broken out into uh, connections uh, capability and culture as well as capital look there's been some amazing themes and it's very hard to draw together all of these but the, the underlying things that you keep hearing is that we have momentum and growth but there's this issue of connectivity that keeps coming up, whether it is at a grassroots level, it is how do we begin to work together to focus our energy and ensure that we have the right incentives that bring people. So that is a mixture of culture as well as platforms. Um, but then also that real provocation about how do we go globally? How do we build the relationships globally? How do we also build the ambition and the vision to be able to go out on a global scale? And then I loved Francis's provocation, which was really, how do we bring the rest of New Zealand into this? That it is not just an innovation, a, a, an inward looking initiative. How do we bring in traditional businesses and how do we um, begin to tell the story and create the vision and the excitement and the inspiration um, that will bring a pipeline and inspire a whole new generation, as well as ensuring that we've got the support, the structures, and the opportunity to bring them into the system and foster and grow them. Um, I'm sure everyone will have quite different outtakes. I'll hand back to Michelle now. Kapai, oh, Rosalie. Um, Paulie, um, if you can stop the live stream, that will end now. So everyone on the uh, live streaming, thank you for partaking. And we're just going to break for a very short, short break. But before you go, we're going to have the panellists are going to co-host the breakout session. So we're going to go into three breakout rooms. Uh, you get to choose which room you go in. So Capital is going to have Suze running it. Connections is going to have Anna. And Capability and Culture is going to have Aubrey. There'll be an EHF staff member in there as well. So before you go to the uh, having a quick break, just think about which room you want to go to and that when you come back in a couple of minutes, you can um, sort of, Paula will get us sort of to go into those rooms. So if you just want to just have some time out very quickly, two function break, which means the bathroom break and the get another drink break. And we'll meet you back here in a couple of minutes. How about at quarter two? See you soon team.
All right, see, I grabbed some more water too. Sunshine in here at the end of the day is fantastic. All right. We are gonna, what I'm gonna do, because I still wanna finish at 5.30. So we're gonna condense down what we we're originally gonna do for the breakouts and just make it a little bit more tighter. So you've got yourselves renamed still, so that's good. I'm just gonna grab my sheet here. Um, we're gonna harvest notes. So Ants and Paula can throw in the chat session there for me. We've got a um, the shared note thing and we're gonna harvest notes when we go into the breakout room. Um, there'll be one of us in each of those rooms. So we'll be taking a lot of notes and we'll be helping one of the panelists. And usually we do run in you know, the law of two clicks. If the room isn't right for you that you get to shift on, but because we're only gonna have probably about a 15 minute breakout, oh, maybe 20 minutes in, so we still need to have, we need to finish it at, at 4.15, so we can have 15 minutes sort of discussion back in. Um, the breakouts will be just a little bit shorter than normal. But if you do feel at the very beginning and not in the right room, then you can shift to the next one. So just a reminder, we are gonna have um, Anna doing connections, and you heard that discussion that was already happening before. So we can you can probably have a bit more in-depth conversation with Anna on that, or start to raise up sort of what are the opportunities that you see in New Zealand from all of the uh, information that you received before. Capital Suze, and I'll be jumping in there with Suze. Ants is gonna be hopping in with Anna on connections, and Paul is gonna jump in on capability and culture with Aubrey. So just sort of, reflect and think a bit more on what you've been hearing maybe jot down more ideas thoughts that you didn't manage to get in currently don't worry too much about what actions are going to come out of this because we will do that in a later session so how are you going with getting those breakouts sorted paula it's all done 20 minutes correct yep yep so you'll be able to select which room you want to go in so hopefully over the break you had a bit of a think about which one do you want to do 25 minutes and we'll finish okay. 15, yeah? Yeah, okay. okay, sounds good. All right, great. And that still leaves it for a, a, a discussion. Did one of you put that document in there and we'll take it each into those rooms as well. So the rooms are open now. And the way that you can choose and you can move around rooms, and uh, if you look at the bottom of some, there is a breakout. And if you hover over the blue number, you will be able to see the join option. And then you join the session that you wanna go. If you need help, uh, write in the chat where you wanna go and one of the co-hosts can send you there. Perfect. Have a good discussion. Just continue what you've already been doing today, I think, team. You can feedback to me. We're just going to popcorn style this just to steal Ants' lovely little term. Um, some reflections that happened in your rooms. Who wants to chime in with some? How about someone from the connection room? I'd love somebody else other than myself to actually. Yes, I like that one too, Anna. Who, who was in Anna's room? Yeah. Um, or Felicity or Huya or um, Mohan or um... I choose Mohan <laughs> well it was a lovely dialogue uh, thank you folks for just throwing me under the bus um, it was a very lovely dialogue it's done with love it's done with love <laughs> always I feel I feel the truck over me in love um but, but it was a lively dialogue of, of really thinking about where connectivity could really be defined. Two levels were considered. One was primarily outside connectivity. And Dino led that dialogue with a real frame of reference saying, yes, it is important to be internally connected to understand your identity, but uh, that is not necessary and sufficient. What is sufficient is to have the energy that was uh, delivered by our keynote address that made us feel that we need to really be externally focused as well and be able to connect to an ecosystem that can fund these ideas. And so there should be two ecosystems, one within the Aotearoa framework and the other um, externally driven. That was the most direct conversation. There were others that fed into that, 
that framed possibly, you know, a more search for identity, which was really coming from my thoughts and others chimed in in agreement, I believe. Uh, if they, if you don't, please rest it today and let's speak of it now. Um, did I miss anything else? Because the framework was really connecting outside, connecting inside. There was a minor uh, skirmish on whether corporate should be involved or not. And that was near the end of the conversation. Uh, and, and the nature of how corporate should be involved because that seemed to be missing in the dialogue here. And, I, and we were advocating either for it not to happen or to happen. Anna, did I cover all the issues? You did a beautiful job. Thank you very much. And I think the other thing is a call to action for EHF to uh, really lead in the space. Yeah. So uh, we pick up that mental, uh, the team and I, and we will work on that. So thank okay. you. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, just, team. That's great. Oh, just thanks. to jump. Just to, I was listening in there intently and just one thought, which I heard as an opportunity. Um, the DNA of EHF as an organization has been in creating gatherings to connect people. Mm -hmm. And we sort of did that for, for three years, both internally with the Welcome Week context and externally with the New Frontiers conferences. And the opportunity that I heard there was for the last two years, we've been unable to do that in the way that we were founded to do it. Yeah. And so one way to look at that is that we've been sort of in this keeping the boat afloat mode. And the other way to look at it is that in 2022, we've been given a two year head start of half of the fellowship have a lot more connection than they ever would have if they'd just landed in the country to do mm -hmm. what we were doing before. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity I see is like, now that we know that what we know with the data that we have, what does it look like for EHF to architect the connectivity and the gatherings in a really strategic way moving mm. into 2022. And just this call where we've got some really fantastic folks from the NZ ecosystem and the fellows from New Zealand and fellows overseas, we're just sitting on really fertile soil. So I'm just going to throw that little seed in the mix there. Well done. I, Thank you. I like it. That's good. Well, they had a great discussion. Okay. What about the, the other room? culture and capability. Who wants to chime in there? Could I throw it to Shay? <laughs> Particularly the point that you made at the end, Shay, which I thought was perfect. Which one was that one, Rosalie? <laughs> <laughs> it's full of ideas. <laughs> I, I, it's, not, it's not top of mind, but I think... Um, you know, what, what we had one one kind of conversation around the importance of ensuring that we don't take aspects of parts of a culture, um, remove it from its original context, and then use it as a faceplate, uh, which is a term that Aubrey used. Uh, and if we do that, then um, we run the risk of a kind of being outside of uh, the this outside of what it needs to actually be successful and um, we just kind of water it down so that was one one thing that I remember hearing um, yeah what other what other ones that you want to talk about one of the ones that I thought was really into was a point that Brett made um, which was actually a shifting of the language and I the way that he described it was that if we use the buzzwords of startup and entrepreneur and all of those things, it's just not going to resonate. But if you were to actually think of this as a, te a television brand, and it was actually about the creation of impact and the storytelling of people and the purpose that was addressing some of the greatest problems that we've got, it would fundamentally both attract and would change the nature of the conversation. Um, and I thought that was, really powerful and then we also talked about the issue of translation um, and that was that was the point Shay that I thought was really interesting that you made if you wanted to pick up on that or anyone else wanted to, to chime in. Can I leap in there because that's a really neat segue and I don't mean to hold the mic either so any of the other um, bods who are in our session by all means chip in but um, solving the really big problems um, because we oh, well, I felt I owned my own anxiety about being the sort of dirty capitalist but of the um, in the capital piece but we had such a cool conversation that was really not about that all about show us the financial returns um, be fine. we've talked about kind of solving the really big kind of existential crises for the world which is around the whole 
you know, our economy and our society is so extractive at the moment. And so we anchored that and how do we, um, Arthur, you articulated it far more neatly about how we um, sort of change the way we um, use our currencies, for instance, to be rather than extractive, to be additive so that you have like, you have credit ratings, you have impact ratings, um, so that encourages us to put more stuff back. Um, and then we also, because we had, um, we'll just come on, the, on, on our group too, we talked about housing and how we make housing kind of more accessible um, and grounded in sustainability, um, that kind of stuff too, which you know, and my kind of sort of framing for that is that um, we talk about a lot of things, um, climate change is one of them as being our big existential crisis, but in fact, I think sort of humanity and sort of social equity is a bigger existential crisis, but we find that so much harder to fix, and yet here in this cohort and this bunch of people, we've got the sort of the germs of being able to fix it um, by being brave um, and getting cracking at it, so that was cool. Anybody else on that call? By all wow. means. <laughs> yeah, one cool thing I really liked about it and our one was how we um, spoke about BC or Mark brought this topic up and then um, art sort of built on it was that uh, VC uh, used to be creative and now it's gone to the sort of financial and it's um, extractive. So how do we, this could be a thing that um, we work with, with the ecosystem and people like Sue's EHF, what we work with them is how do we then get that circle going back around so we get back to it being creative? And even if it's just in New Zealand, you know, we can lead in that by flipping VC back to being creative instead of extractive. And brave. It's not about getting wussy about generating returns mm -hmm. or anything like that. In fact, that's still the big piece in it that we want to create this exponential impact and value. But instead of anchoring it in sort of slightly rudely, I put it sort of financial returns, it's more about the sort of socioeconomic returns that we, and if we do that, then the financial returns will come with that as well, but we just have to get focused on creating the value first. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Any other last reflections? We've covered all rooms otherwise. Well, I hope you've had a great session. Um, it's probably felt long, but I think it's been really worthwhile. So just know that this is just the beginning. It's just the start of the conversation. All we've done today is harvest about and hear a lot of data and hear a lot of points. Um, there is going to be activity that comes after. So we will be running events in the, in the new year as well. So what we have got coming up um, at late March and in February, there's the blockchain paper that's been run through Callahan. Um, so they are sort of working on that at the moment and, we, and with our fellows. So art, if you want to be interested in helping out and that sort of thing, there's lots of different things there. So that'll be late February or into March. And we've also got the space. So we're a stakeholder there with MB on the, the space strategy. A lot of our fellows have been helping out with that as well. And tomorrow morning, there is actually still another session on the mini springboard if you want to come. It's at 8.30, well, no, actually it's 8 till 10.30. And that's um, Rod Oram is running it. It's New Zealand's priorities and opportunities in the decade of climate action. So we actually are going to be lucky to have um, Hillary Laureate, Johan Rockstrom. He is going to be speaking for the first sort of 40 minutes. Uh, Vicky from MFE is going to jump in. And Rod is going to sort of facilitate the whole thing and wrap up about uh, post COP26 as well. So that um, should be very good, but thank you all for partaking. It's been good. And so thanks for hanging in there until the very end. Thank you. I'm thank just you for gonna... the organization and love that went in behind us. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you guys are welcome. It's cool, it's good. Um, so I'm just gonna close us off with a karakia. Kia tō tō rangamai, te runga e nā iwi o te ao. Kia ora. <laughs>